you're, you're one of those guys I've always heard on uh, with Mark Walters. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, this, this is what probably intimidated me. I'm like, oh, shit, I've heard him on Mark before. Yeah. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you're very strongly opinionated, which is wonderful. I got no time for slaves and cowards. Shotgun with Charlie. Riding shotgun refers to the practice of sitting next to the driver in a moving vehicle. The term riding shotgun came around after the time of the stagecoach, when somebody used to sit next to the driver holding a shotgun, in case they ran into bandits. My name is Charlie Cook, and I drive a lot. I like to talk to people while I'm driving, so I interview people in my car while I'm driving. Welcome to Riding Shotgun with Charlie. All right, before we start this episode of Writing Shotgun with Charlie, I want to thank Rob and Amanda from the Eye on the Target radio show for letting me use their stagecoach. We are filming some shows in Indiana, uh, Indiana. Indianapolis, Indiana. Indianapolis, Indiana at the uh, NRA annual meetings. And so I want to thank them. And uh, if you do not know who Rob and Amanda are, check them out at eyeonthetargetradio.com. All right, welcome to this episode of Writing Shotgun with Charlie. Today we are in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I have with me Paul Markle, the student of the gun. Paul, thank you so much for being well, on. Thank you for being here. I am I'm honored to have guys like you on because you guys are badass and intimidate me. And uh, I just try to tell people I keep up with everyone else. <laughs> that is legit all I'm trying to do. Oh, I'm also known as the Pimp Hand of America. Yes, the Pimp Hand of America. Because, because this country needs a slap. And it wasn't a wasn't a job I was looking for, but it was one that I accepted. <laughs> there you go. So you know I wasn't See, out there looking for it, but when it, <laughs> so it's funny. You, you got you I got, I got the, the dash cam going you, on. You got the drunk cart, right? And, and then you got the you got a you got the cops and cops the, uh, full of uh, the, uh, the four wheeler. A four wheeler. So we've noticed this. As well. <laughs> we've noticed this. The all the we've seen the cops ride motorcycles. We've seen a ton of them. Right in the little um, the, the the go karts there, mm -hmm. but we haven't seen any cops in cars. The side by sides, yeah, yeah. I saw them, I saw them on bicycles giving out parking tickets yesterday. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah we, well, were... some dude just like he pulled right up on the sidewalk, like literally up onto the sidewalk, and <laughs> there was a big pickup truck. And I walked up. I said, "Is this not a parking space?" And the dude turns. <laughs> he looks at me. He goes, "Is this your truck?" I'm like, "No, I'm not an idiot." <laughs> He's like, "Oh, okay." And then I hear a guy yelling, I'm getting ready to move it. I'm oh getting ready God. to move it. And it's like, okay, that's a fun story. That's awesome. That so. is awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's there. there's so many stupid people. But it's it's all right. It is what it is. It is. Uh, you, you said your hotel was on the road where a bunch of homeless people were living in the streets. And I'm like, ah, is that every street? Or is it just Paul being Paul? And then I turned down St. George Road, and there's a lot of homeless people. Oh, in yeah. The yeah they were having a good time having having uh, one man conversations, one woman conversations last oh, night. Oh, nice, nice. You know, years ago, back in the olden days, when we actually had to hook up wires to our phones to talk into them, <laughs> you know, I had this idea that you should just they should just give out free headsets to to the homeless. Oh, people. the homeless people. So they so when they're standing like they're on the street corner, like waving their hands and talking, it just looked like they're, they're having, having a conversation. A conversation. Yeah. yeah, that's a great plan. But and I told that to my son, and he said, "Yeah, but if you saw a person now with wires hanging out of their ears standing there, he goes, you would think they're a crazy person because nobody does that anymore, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, that's true. You know, you know what the times change. Thing. What are you gonna do?" Okay. All right, so tell us about you. you. You've been a gun guy. You've been a gun guy forever. You've got uh, military and police experience, right? Yeah, pretty much my whole life. Uh, you know, I, I I fell in love with guns uh, from an early age. You know, I I was the kid. I was the kid who was seven years old running around his backyard with a with a rifle shaped stick. You know, nice. with oh, the yeah, rifle shaped yeah. stick. With, with oh, right, yeah. that kind of V down. Yeah, we used to, you know, you, I, I, you'd look and find a rifle shaped stick and so forth. And uh, then when I was about, I guess, 10 or 11, my, uh, my uh, maternal grandfather, they had a cabin in northern Michigan. And when we would go up there, he would let me shoot the uh, Daisy single action or single oh, cock, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. a lever action BB gun. And that's, that's, he taught me how to shoot it. And, yeah, they take me up there. I was 11 years old. They'd buy, uh, 
tube of BBs and them shaker tubes. Oh, yeah. We stop at the gas station on the way to the cabin and get a shaker tube of BBs, and you know, two days later they were all gone. Oh my yeah, god, they were all gone. But I, I would, that thing would be at in the, my oh, hand at from, the grocery store. Oh, like yeah, grocery store or gas station, gas station or every store. place. Yeah, every place had you know BBs. Jeez. Uh, back in the old days. I mean, Back in free America. Well, yeah, back and in, in, and they had twenty two shells and shotgun shells in the counter too. Yeah. That's it's kind of when I started, and then you know I always knew that I wanted to be a marine, mm -hmm. and I, I took some time off of high school because uh, I got out of high school and I was convinced that I was in love. You know, <laughs> I did. I was. I was convinced that I was in love, and I don't. Know, maybe I was, but. It, believe it's sad stories it didn't work out shocking yeah so it didn't work out so it, you know then i was like well all right maybe it's time for you to go ahead and pull the trigger and uh i joined the marine corps i joined relatively late i actually didn't go in until my uh 20th birthday like the day after my 20th birthday oh wow uh, but you know did time in the infantry uh was uh part of the back in the old days when we used to have marines on ships i was on the uss forestall as part of the marine detachment yeah, Marines have been on ships since the history of the country, since the founding of the country. Uh, and then uh, around cl the Clinton era, mm -hmm. they decided to uh, pussify the military. And uh, they started taking the Marines off ships because Marines are mean and they hurt soldiers fe or sailors' feelings. You know, they, they hurt their, they damage their self esteem. Right. And they're like, we can't let these Marines be on these ships. They're mean and they say mean things and they damage the self esteem. And I don't know how, I don't, forgive me. I'll, I'll keep it PG 13 ish. Oh, oh that's PG 13 ish. <laughs> so, well, it, that was right at the time. So, you can tell me whether this is a coincidence or not. Right. So, right at the time that the they decided they were going to put women on combat ships, mm -hmm. at the same time they decided they were going to pull the Marines off of the ships. Shocking. You can say that's a coincidence <laughs> if you want. I don't know. I think the timing is just a little bit too little convenient. Strange. Yeah. Yeah, uh, for sure, yeah. for sure. But yeah, I, I was old core. I was, you know, when I was in a ship, it was all men. It was a combat ship. And yep. then I got off the ship, went back to the infantry. I was with six Marines. And we ended up, uh, we were on deployment over to Okinawa uh, in 1990. And if you know your general history of the world, we're hanging out in the jungle doing jungle warfare training in the summer of 1990. We come out of the jungle. They have a big formation, and the battalion commander comes out to talk to us, which never happens. Yeah. And he's like, essentially, it's P.S. Uh, jungle training's off. Desert warfare's on. Get ready to go to the desert. Boom. Wow. So they, we traded out our green camis for brown camis, went over, and we did Desert Storm Part 1, or Desert War Part 1. Mm -hmm. Of course, back then, you know, this guy's kind of like the guys in World War One. They didn't know that it was number one. You know, right. They didn't know there was another. There was right, a it was the Great War. They didn't know there was a sequel coming. Right? Yeah, they just <laughs> called it the Great War, and we did the same thing. We were over there. We're like, oh, we're in the Desert War. You know, we didn't know there was a sequel coming mm. down the line. Uh, so we did the first one. The first one was successful. You know, I didn't right. die, uh, so it worked out. And uh, then I, of course, they did exactly what they always do after a conflict or a war or whatever. They look at the at the sheer number of people that are in, yeah. and they say, um, we need to go ahead and reduce the total numbers, right? So start giving guys their, their papers. And they didn't even try to rec to retain. Really? Oh, yeah. They didn't, the, the, the career planners, we call them the jammers. The jammers <laughs> come around, and they're, this is this was pretty much the jammers briefing me. He's like, he goes, uh, you know, your enlistment's up because uh, you really didn't want to re-enlist, did you? Right, to the Jedi mind trick? Yeah, he's like, you didn't really want to re-enlist, did you? Uh, and he said, well, he says, you could re-enlist, but, but there's no openings in your MOS. So if you do re-enlist, you'll have to do a lateral move and, and pick another career. And, and I, I'm sitting there, I was like, bro. Yes. I was pretty salty by the time because I was a combat veteran. I had my combat action ribbon and I was like, it's like, I don't need your, I don't need your stuff, bro. So I got out and I said, oh, yeah, I got a smart idea. My mom was friends with the police chief at one of, at the town, like next to where we live in Ohio. Mm -hmm. So I went back to Ohio where I had come from and uh, chief's like, oh yeah, come on, get on the auxiliary and, and blah, 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 blah. I ended up in the police academy, cool beans, right? Used my GI bill, went to the police academy, went to the sheriff's academy, got my state certification, yep. started job hunting started realizing that 
there was 500,000, okay, man, that's an stretch, but at least 250,000 dudes just like me just got out of the Army, just got out of the Marine Corps, went to the police academy. Mm -hmm. and I would give you a good example. I went to Canton, Ohio PD's uh, civil service exam. Yeah. 500 people take a test in a high school gymnasium or cafeteria and for three positions. Oh my God. Yeah. And almost all of them were veterans. Yeah. You know, so we were all in the same boat. But here's what I wasn't. I wasn't a woman and I didn't have a dark enough tan. And if you guys know anything about the history of the early 1990s, the centralized federal government decided that, well, we're gonna give bonus points to anybody who's born with a vagina and a dark tan. They get extra points. So they, they just got more points for showing up for the test. Wow. I was like, oh, this is this is kind of some bull crap right here. So what I- about, uh, What about your white privilege, man? No, that, that my, my white privilege so card expired. My white privilege card had expired. So, uh, years earlier, I had, I had uh, actually, when I was the ripe old age of 19, I had attended this bodyguard school in Aspen, Colorado, called Executive Security International, still in business. And, but at the time, uh, I discovered that there was no one in the world that was going to hire a 19 or a 20 year old right. to do any kind of real security, anything. Sure. And I talked to a dude, um, who said, here's what you need to do. He said, you ever thought about joining the army? I was like, no, I was like, join the Marine Corps. He goes, go away, go to the military, get some experience, come back with experience. Then we'll hire you. Yeah, then we'll do. So I realized I wasn't getting very far uh, with full-time cop gig. So I actually went, I lat moved over and I started doing executive protection work. And I did, mm. I did uh, full-time bodyguard work for about 13, 14 years. Wow. But while I was doing that, I also maintained a police commission with the city that I lived in because I would travel. I'd get a gig. I did some full-time stuff where I worked all the time and then I did a lot of contract stuff. So I was kind of hit and miss here and there and all over. Which I did a lot of traveling. And I got a, ended up with a gig. If you want to know how student the gun started, I ended up with a gig doing, uh, I went, and in the meantime, I went back into the Marine Corps Reserve and I did that all before 9-11. Wow. So, but uh, I got a contract during GWAT. Uh, for, they were looking for small arms and tactics instructors. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got on this contract gig and I became a military contractor and uh, ended up in Mississippi teaching on a military base full-time small arms and tactics. And I did that for a while. But the nature of contracts is when the contract starts, the the you know the contracting officers are all excited the program's cool it's neat and we need to do this we need to spend money and then the farther away it gets like well can we do the same thing with less money can we mm. do the same thing with fewer people and you and a, a buddy of mine said he goes as soon as people start leaving and aren't getting replaced you know it's like oh these guys left but here's what we'll do we'll just spread the workload out amongst the remaining people <laughs> right He's like, as soon as that happens, he goes, run for the door. Jesus. He's like, get, you, get your resume ready. He goes, because it's never going to get better. Right. No, no kidding. No kidding. <laughs> it's never going to get better. You know, it's the, it's the only job that you can work and and as the years go by, be paid the same amount or less <laughs> for, for doing, more work, for, more for work. doing more work. Right. You know, it's like, how do you get that gig? So, uh, and, and I had been in the interim, you know, when I was in the Marine Corps, I was a uh, uh a coach, a, a rifle and pistol marksmanship coach, mm -hmm. went through coaches school in the Marine Corps. Oh, that's cool. And uh, and I started when I was a when I was a bodyguard, when I was a cop. I started taking instructor classes and so on and so forth. So I, I really like to do that, and I started doing it. And I ended up uh, meeting some people. I, and oh, I was also a writer. <laughs> uh, while I was working as a bodyguard, one of my mentors told me. He said he, he, he said anyone who is a professional whether it's a lawyer, a doctor, whatever. If you're in a profession, because a stepping stone in a profession is to be published. Like okay. all, all doctors want to be published. Right. All attorneys want to be published. Sure, you know, college professors, engineers, publish or die. Yeah, they want, they got to, you have to publish something. And so I took that to heart. So I thought, well, I'll, I'm going to start writing and sending things out. Mm -hmm. In 1993, I wrote three articles Sent them out to three different magazines, 
Yeah. And two of the three bought my articles. And I was like, whoa, that's pretty this cool. Kind of cool, man. Right. Your odds and, are good. Yeah. So uh, one of the one of the publishers was in New York, and the editor called me. And it's like, hey, this Harry Kane with Harris Publications, I got your work, I want to buy it. I'm going to go ahead and publish it. Tell me about yourself. Hold on a second. Harris Publications, they put out a lot of gun stuff, didn't they? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Harris used to own tons of gun magazines. Right. Uh, and so he said, uh, yeah, I wrote a thing about being, like, the day-to-day -day being a bodyguard. Like, right. what, what I would carry and stuff like that. And this is 93, 94 time frame, early 90s. So like old school stuff like like Motorola StarTac flip phones and things like that, you know. Right. Um, so I, I wrote about that, and he said, "Hey, would you would you want to write about this and this?" And I was like, "Yeah, sure," you know. And then, uh, so he you know he vetted me, and that's where I started writing. And I wrote, you know, I've been writing well, it's 2023 now, so for basically 30 years. Hmm. And that's pretty cool. So you know, I got in the industry and I started meeting a lot of other guys. Yeah in the industry and uh, one guy I said well you ever thought about doing TV and so I ended up hooking up with this this producer and coming up with Student of the Gun TV we did Student of the Gun television back during the cable days cable satellite days of mm -hmm. the of the when did we launch 2000 I started that we did the concept in the original pitch in 2010 and we aired in 2011 2012 and, and uh, it's People were like, oh, dude, that's awesome. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. But, uh, back then, there was only a few outlets for that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Right? Outdoor like, Channel, outdoor Hunt channel. channel, Sportsman's Channel. And I, right. we were on all of them at one point in time. There's one in Canada, I think it's called. I'm sorry, Canada. Canada. I can't remember what the name of your channel is. That's it's like right. the, I don't know, the outdoors, hooting, hunting, sporting channel. Yeah. Hunt yeah. Channel. Hunt well, Channel. Well, there was eh? Pursuit. Ch okay. Hunt. There was Hunt Channel, Pursuit Channel. Mm hmm. Sportsman's Channel and Outdoor Channel, and now they pretty much are all con an amalgamation of each other. Right. Like I think it's like this the Outdoor Pursuit and Channel. Sportsman are the same company now, right. and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, because well, because cable died, and, and you know, cable died, and freaking satellite died. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I've been kind of a talker, if you can tell. I noticed. My wife used to say, "She's like, if you get a job where someone would pay you to talk, that's when you would be do. rich. Yeah, you, <laughs> you need to do that thing, uh, right?" So I launched, I talked to some other guys and, and I said, hey, you know, what what do I need to do to do a, a podcast radio? Because, you know, on demand in around 2012, 2013 was new. Mm -hmm. Like today, if you're producing content that's not available on demand, you're wasting your time. Like that's literally you're wasting your time. Uh, so we started doing an on demand show called Studio Gun Radio. And this is our 10th year. Uh, that's correct. Cool. That's great. So that's the. That's basic. great. So did, did you hire? A, did you guys do everything? Because your your sons work with you. Yeah. And they do. Uh, I don't want to say the grunt work, but they do. You know, you, you got a son behind the camera. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. All that sort of stuff. Um, did you uh, Did you have to hire a production company back then? Yeah. Well, originally when we when I first started doing TV, I, I had a producer, and the producer contracted videographers and editors. Okay. And I would sit with the editors and go over the footage. And, I was so new, I was so green. You know, we I would write everything. I was a writer, so I'd write out all the segments. Yeah. Then I, we would film the segments. I'd host them. We'd have guests and do all that, you know, jazz. Mm -hmm. And then when it's over, I would go over to the editor's house and we would sit down. And we had two monitors, and we're like, okay, boom, boom, boom. And uh, you know, the the first thing you do in editing is set the audio. Yes. Especially for TV. For right. TV, if you have a see, people don't understand this. Because with freeform stuff like YouTube and everything, it can be 15 minutes and 18 seconds. Right. Uh, but when we were doing TV, it had to be 24, 20. Gotcha. 24 minutes and 20 seconds. Yeah. To the second. Right. Because you right. got commercial spots. Yeah. Yeah. So you got to have the yeah the, the front, the back, the middle, and everything. So. Uh, I'm not going to hit this guy because yeah. he's, he's way too big. That's cool. That's cool. He's like, he goes. Homeboy's got freaking cameras on his thing. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, so you set the audio track first. Mm -hmm. The audio track is set down to where exactly 2420, whatever it is. Right. You know? And then you fill in the video after that. And I, and I, I learned a lot from this guy. Mm. And it, what's funny is he, we were sitting there and he, and he said, You know what we're doing right now, Paul? It's called producing the show. <laughs> 
I never got a producer credit for season one and two, even though I was producing the thing. Right. Yeah. Somebody was telling me, I, I tell them all the stuff that I do for my show and they're like, so you're the host, you're the producer, you're the video editor. I'm like, I'm, whatever needs to be done is what I do, right? Mm -hmm. I'm the marketing guy, I'm the, yeah. the social media guy. Like, I, I just, it's all the stuff you gotta do. Yeah, that's cool, that's cool. So what kind of stuff did you guys talk about on Student of Gun TV? Back oh then? man, we, we, we did all kinds of stuff. I mean, I, obviously, I, I gravitated towards what I, what I know, you know, home defense, personal defense, concealed carry, stuff like that. Right. And uh, we, we, had, we had a little bit of, I wouldn't say a lot of competition-y stuff, but like for instance, uh, one year Sig Sauer was our sponsor, and oh Jesus! Hmm. All right. So we're gonna have a conversation, I guess. But uh, everybody, but he's okay. standing and he's talking, he's so he's and not talking. injured. Right. So right, and he has his mask on, so Oof. the mask protects you from everything. Yeah. No, we're, we're good there. So there you go. There we are. I'm sure that lady wished she was wearing her brown pants today. Yeah, she probably wished she wouldn't have been wearing her brown pants. Yeah. You know, Max Michelle, you know who Max Michelle is? Yeah, competitive shooter. Yeah, yeah, Max, we, I, uh, Max co-hosted a segment with me, like, for 13 segments of season two. He's he's totally righteous, dude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good dude. Good dude. Mm -hmm. So we would do that, and you know, we talk about, you know, whatever, whatever I, I was quite frankly, whatever I was interested in. It's your show. It's yeah, it's my show. I don't to do what I'm interested in, right? Uh, for the most part, which is one of the reasons I don't do TV so much now, because quite frankly, there's it's so saturated, and I just can't make myself go and do like, hey, we're here at the Bullet Factory, and we're right. gonna we're gonna walk around and talk about. Bullets. Bullet ways. Bullets are nice and everything, but yeah, it, it, was, it was like. Uh, so that's kind of where I am. Like I, I decided to, to do an interview show because I wanted to I wanted to increase my circle of friends, and I live in occupied territory in New England, Massachusetts. So all I the wouldn't stuff. I tell people in public. I know everyone knows. I, I don't make it a you know, I ah uh, whatever. It is what it is. Um, there's, I, I always tell people, I said, you know what, I, I don't review guns because there's there's guns that I can't get and I can't have. And like looking at gun magazines of all the, the cool latest whiz bang doesn't. Do you really look at gun magazines? Things. Not really. Yeah, nobody does actually. Yeah, I, I get them they in the mail. They still exist, kind of. Right, I get them in the mail, I stack them up, and my daughter's like, when do you have to throw those things out, Dad? What the funny thing is, like, um, yeah, I wrote for the, the, I wrote for pretty much every paper rag that there were was mm -hmm. i wrote for nra for shooting illustrated i wrote for uh, swat magazine or for harris publications i wrote for uh, american handgunner and uh, firearms marketing group and all those guys uh, but i went to the, the other day i was in a i was in wyoming in a kroger or not for kroger what does kroger own it's a uh, farm not farmer's market what the heck i don't know yeah they, they don't want them it's, it's they, not you know Publix, kroger, right huh yeah. it's not Publix. No, stuff. no, no, no. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I go over to the, the rack. There was one gun magazine. They're like literally zero. Wow. And this is in Wyoming. Right? That's free. Yeah. Like that. I'm like, so it's not like, oh, well, yeah, what did you expect? It's, you know, New Jersey or something. They're not going to have any. No. It's just because they're not moving them. Mm. So, and then the racks just get smaller and smaller all the time. You know, it used to be. I mean, it used to be like they took up one whole half oh, of the yeah. aisle. Yeah. Now it's just like literally like a, a, a four foot wide rack, and that's it. Mm. Cat fancy and modern knitting and you know stuff like that. Right. Funny thing enough, Harris, who did gun magazines, mm -hmm. they did everything, and, and I didn't realize it until I started working for them that they did like Golf Digest and you oh, know wow. Summer Pride and right. Dog Fancy and you know. <laughs> tennis magazines and all this stuff yeah and what's funny as i talked to the dudes who they, then they had occupied several floors on an office building on broadway and so you had like the 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 knitting and the dog fancy you know editors on one floor mm -hmm. and they owned rap music magazines so they had like the rapper magazine guys on another oh floor gosh. and then the, he said he goes and then there was the gun floor where the gun magazine people were. Right. And the funny thing is, like, dude, they're all living in New York. They're living <laughs> in New York City. But, the, like, the cat fancy people are like, oh, the gun people are up 
on the you know the twelfth floor oh or something. God. I was like, yeah, that's ridiculous. Like, like they had machine guns up there or something. You know, it's, it was New York City. They didn't have anything. It's uh, it's screwy how uh, how how people that aren't gun folks think about gun folks. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's all it's all, all out of whack. You know, it's all out of whack. I've, I've been to uh, been to some concealed carry fashion shows, and. When I, when I invite friends and say, hey, listen, you know, you're not a gun person, but you can come check this out. Uh, it's kind of a fun thing. The money goes to, to the pro-gun groups and whatever. And they're like, oh, yeah, but guns and alcohol. They're, I'm like, well, it's going to be a cash bar. They're like, guns and alcohol don't mix. I'm like, you, you know, we have some judgment where we... Uh, yeah, what the, what do you think we're doing, man? It's right. Like, it's, it's, it's not yeah, like... Yeah, we're, we're all on our front porches. Yeehaw! <laughs> right. Like, Drinking with not, our left hand from the jug and glass from the right hand. hand. Like, come on. Really? Well, and then you get people that are like, they're like insanely brainwashed. Like I had a guy ask me, he says, he goes, well, my wife in the e my wife and I in the evening, we like to have a glass of wine when we're watching television or relaxing. And what would we do if someone broke into our home? And I, and I was like, right, I'm not tracking here, bro. <laughs> I was like, you should do stuff to make them not be in your house. What are you like, right. well, well, we, we wouldn't be able to use our firearms. And I was like, oh, bro. It's like, are you like rip roaring stone drunk while you're right. drinking? How your, much wine? How much drinking? wine are you consuming? Like jugs of that, it? Right. But this dude, food. in his brain, he'd been so like brainwashed. Um, it's like, dude, the, the dude that's breaking into your house with a gun is definitely on some kind of oh, yeah. illicit Absolutely. substance. Okay. So I, I was like, well, don't get hammered. How's that? Let's just start with that. Don't sit in your house getting hammered, you know? Right. But, you know, and if you drink one glass of wine five times a week, your alcohol tolerance is pretty good, you know? You're probably not, like, you know, falling down drunk. But, right. Yeah, no. And there's you the other tolerance for sure. But it's crazy. People don't understand. It. And there's the, uh, what does IU call it? The um, doctrine of competing harms. You know, it's like the doctrine of competing arms. They're like, well, would you rather be have your wife be shot and stabbed and have your wife raped uh, because you didn't want to pick up your home security gun because you had had a glass of Merlot? Like, dude, you got to get your priorities right now. Absolutely. But but the idea that somebody would ask that, like, it's it's a little ludicrous. Yeah, it's like 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 don't go out in public and get drunk. All right, that's that's always a good. It's, that's a good. It's a good. That's, good thing a to good live thing. By. Yeah, it's yeah. a good uh, standard to have, regardless. Yeah, you know. I have uh, I have some friends. I, I call them my surrogate family. That uh, I live with these people for a little bit. We went on a trip uh, to to Europe with them. Been to their weddings. I, I the band I used to play in played at one of their daughters' weddings. And when after I became a gun guy, they're like, "Oh, you know what? We know gun people aren't really bad because we knew you before you became a gun guy." And I'm like. That's really bigoted of you. Wow. Like, I wow. can't believe... Do they have you're... black friends, too? <laughs> On paper, I guess so, right? Yeah, it's like... Uh, they, have, they have just they have one just to say they have one, right? Yeah, wow. Uh, yeah, it's completely nuts that they would think that because maybe my, my politics changed because I became a gun guy, because I wanted to protect myself and my family, that I'm now some some lunatic. It's okay, because you, you, you weren't like that from the beginning. Right, I wasn't always that way. Well, everyone's I love like changing this. their minds here. I love this. A U turn. Now, I don't object to doing a U turn in the middle of the road, but if there are other cars around you, then I got a problem with that because you are stopping the flow of traffic. No, 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 no. You you're just trying to to push your feelings and opinions on other people, <laughs> and that's not right. I, what it really comes down to. It's very close minded. It, it, it is, isn't it? Oh, Stay. Okay. Um, my attitude is this, I must not think well enough of myself to interrupt everyone else. Yeah, I know. It's like, <laughs> like I don't, uh, I don't think that much of myself that, Ooh, I need to walk in the middle of traffic. All right. All right. We, okay. She's telling me to she, go. He's telling yeah, me Miss, to You're giving us big signals here. <laughs> Homeboy's like, yeah, go ahead. And she's like, no, no, stop. no. Like, oh, oh my God. You're, you're killing me here, Smalls. 
All right, we're gonna, we're gonna go around this again. To what get what, what was this thing called? This is this is a central square. Central square. A central a rotary this, something or other. It's a, it's a, honestly we were at uh, Nikki Blaine's last night having a couple of drinks and a cigar, and uh, you come outside and it's it's a zoo. It's what it is. Everyone's hanging out. Yeah, everybody's so telling me about that. Time. I'm a cigar dude, and I'm like, mm, what's up, Glenn? Did you see my? You know Marty from Talking Lay. I do not. Oh well. All right. This yeah, he texted me last night. And it was too late. He's like, "Hey, you know where Nikki Blaine's is? Cigar bar?" And the answer is no. But now I know of it. Yeah. So I went last night with the um, uh, staying with a buddy, and uh, he's like, "We need we need to go to Nikki Blaine's and have a cigar." I'm like, All right, whatever, man. So we go there. I'm I'm wiped. I've been up for it seems like two days. I slept for nothing, and then I I I got almost no sleep. And then um, uh, I got almost no sleep, and then I slept an hour on the plane to fly out here. And uh, so we went out. I, I was spent. I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm ready for bed, man. I'm an old guy. But it was great. We ended up, like, we were just hanging out, talking to ourselves. Um, and then it was another guy, uh, another group of guys next to us. And then somehow, somehow something happened. There it is, Nikki Blaine's. Uh, somehow something happened, and um, they said uh, they were they were here for the NRA as well. So then... Uh, you know, this is the this is the great thing about gun folks. Um, as soon as you find out someone else is a gun guy, it's like old home week. Oh yeah, you know. Yeah. And and honestly, this is this is one of these things that really aggravates me about the uh, the anti gun folks is when you meet someone that's someone else that's a pro gun guy or pro gun gal, you already have something in common you can talk about, and not, none of the other stuff matters. You know, the, the politics and race and gender and all that crap, whatever, man. It, none of that stuff matters. You mean like masculine and feminine and neutral? <laughs> right. You said you said gender. Did you uh, mean sex? No, no. Uh, whatever. Did you sex mean male falls, and female? I mean, because here it, in the English in the English language, when we talk about animals, we describe them as male or female, and that's sex. When we're talking about the written or spoken language, it's either masculine, feminine, or neutral. It's either gotcha. he, she, or it's an it because it's a desk lamp, <laughs> right? So. Now, see, I always thought sex was a verb. No, no, it's a descriptor. <laughs> okay. But uh, see, that's part of the that's part of the destruction of the culture. It's part of the destruction of the culture and destruction of the language. You destroy the culture, you destroy the language, you destroy the people. Lenin knew that. Marx knew that. Marx knew that you needed to destroy the family and the church in order to gain control of the people. Mm. How do you destroy the family? I don't know. You destroy what a family is. You know, two yeah. dudes and a dog is a family now, right? Sure. Like, sure, that's family. But you, see, the thing is. When everything is a right, nothing is a right. This is like The Incredibles, right? When yep. everyone's special, no one is special. When everything is a right, nothing is a right. When everything is family, like, well, you know, my, my me and my two cats are a family. It's like, no, you're a dude who has two cats. Um, and you probably need some help. But that's not a family. When everything's family, nothing's family. You yeah. destroy it. It's like destroying the language. And uh, if I can recommend something to you, yes, I will recommend a book to you, and I'll recommend a book to you. Yeah, I would recommend a book called The Rape of the Mind by Yust Mirlu. It's just called The Rape of the Mind. You don't need to remember the author's name. You'll remember that. It's not expensive. It's it's Kindle audio. It's paperback. Get the paperback. You don't want to take lots and lots of notes. And if, if you were, you knew it well, I'm assuming most of your viewers know that things were not right in 2020 2021 oh 2022 God. you know you know that there are lies being told you know that there was deception you know that things were not right and you may have been convinced that well everyone was just trying to do the best they could with the information they had and sure some people made mistakes but no read the book the playbook for tyranny, the playbook for con for human conditioning, for political conditioning, it's out there, and they've been running it. Uh, but, but the trick is, is they can run it so much better now, mm. thanks to this. Yeah, right. Everyone's got one, man. Um, I have a copy of uh, Saul Alinsky's Rule for Radicals, mm -hmm. and then I have a copy of Paul Vallone's Rules for Anti-Radicals. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like buying books more than I like reading books. Mm. So I have a copy of both. My books. son is, my son's kind of like that. He's like, he has a, he's like a book collector, 
Right. Yeah, yeah, he's like, but if, if you have you read 1984? I've listened to it on tape. I tried watching the movie a couple times. I can't fucking make it through the movie. Okay. Oh, uh, and one of the things the, the guy who recommended it to me, he said, "Have you read 84?" I was like, "Yeah, I read it." I actually read it in eighth grade and did a book report on it. Mm. I did a, a stand-up oral book report on 1984 in eighth grade in 1981. <laughs> Wrap your brain around that. <laughs> right. Uh, if you've ever read that, if you've ever read Brave New World, if you've ever read Fahrenheit 451. Yeah. Uh, and if you read, especially 84, if you read that and then you read The Rape of the Mind, it makes more sense to you. And you're okay. like, oh, wow. Uh, it's it doesn't and the thing is it doesn't seem like it's fiction. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's and that you know, eighty four nineteen eighty four is supposed to be a fiction novel. It was supposed to be a playbook. Right. What's the old saying? Make uh, nineteen eighty four fiction. Fiction again. again. Exactly. Exactly. That's wild. Mm. Yeah. This is it's uh, having having someone knowledgeable like you. It's, it's always an education. Like I got to go back. I got to take notes. I'll try. Right. Make a reading list. All right, let's do it. I didn't. I don't know if I ever created anything, but I, I sat at the feet of the masters and I paid attention. That's one thing that I can pride myself on is uh, I might not be the brightest uh, light bulb in the package, but mm -hmm. I do learn from. I'm a quick learner and I pay attention. You know, that's one of the things coming up. Uh, I was talking to my friend Ken today, and he said he just, he said there's a difference being a sentinel. He said paying attention to the world around you legitimately paying attention to what's happening and not just like looking left and right like a nervous mouse right. but actually paying attention and analyzing the world around you hmm. and that was one of the first things i learned you know when i was 19 years old uh going to bodyguard school is the the primary job of a bodyguard is actually not to stand in front of someone and take a bullet or whatever the it's primary job is to make sure that nothing happens hmm. and not just nothing but to make sure nothing unexpected or unanticipated happens. And a good bodyguard, a good executive protection agent, controls every single aspect of their client's movement, life, whatever. Mm. Like so, like the, in advance, if a client's gonna go to a restaurant, a client doesn't go to the restaurant until it's already been advanced, until there's already a guy been there, right. talked to the maitre d', walked around, looked at everything, made sure they, because people who have bodyguards don't stand at the front with a little buzzer for right, chilies and, and wait. waiting for their table. <laughs> right. You know, they walk straight in, go straight to a table. People who are, uh, you know, have bodyguards don't go to the front desk and get the keys hmm. and, and say, they walk straight to their rooms because you're controlling every aspect of that. Because them standing around in a lobby is a risk. Them yeah. standing around outside with the freaking Chili's buzzer is a risk. And you minimize all of that. And that's part of being a bodyguard. And also it's noticing every single thing that's out of place. And in order to notice what out, what's out of place, you have to know what is commonplace. Mm. And here's the thing, kids. If you got your head in your freaking phone all day long, you have no idea what is commonplace yeah. and what is out of place. This is true. Because you don't know what's going on. It's a little free one from Harold Paul right there. <laughs> there we go. All right, listen. I don't know where the hell we are. Ah, cool. Do you? No. Perfect. Now, people say, uh, people accuse me of uh, taking people out and getting lost. Okay, that that is the mall. All right. So, here's what I know. The Omni's that way. All right. Yep. Because there's the comedy on? club. The, the parking garage is underneath that. That's where yep. we parked. And so the Omni is right down that block. Very cool. Yeah. Well, we can't turn that way right now. No, you can't right now. Yes. That's, and there's, that, there's where you were. There's, and you thought, that yeah. is where I was. Yep. All right. So we got one-way streets downtown. One-way so streets, so we could either one. hit the, the rotary again. Yep. Or what did you call it? The I don't know what that is. Surface the thing. The thing. I can't believe they haven't torn that down. I can't believe it hasn't offended someone. Maybe that's why they got the stuff around because they got to take it down because someone's offended. Yeah, I'm offended that people. Some blue haired psychopath is offended. We're going to take down all our statues. God, it's so stupid, man. It's so stupid. When you have no history, you have no culture. And this is how you eliminate it. That's right? how you eliminate it. And then all people have is the state. All people have is now and what is now. 
now is whatever you're told it, it is. Mm. This is some deep stuff. It's all there, man. It is all there. It's all all right. There. How do people find Student of the Gun? It's did, it's I mean, hard to find. It's called studentofthegun.com. And that's where everything is? That is the centralized hub. If you want to listen to me talk, if you want to read my books, if you want to watch videos with my beautiful mug in them, if you want to do anything, start at studentofthegun.com and okay. branch out from there. All right. We are on iHeartRadio, Spotify, right next to Joe Rogan, iTunes, every podcatcher in the world. They, they do seem to catch a lot of them, don't they? Yeah. I don't know how the podcast guys do it, but man, they show up everywhere. Uh, you have a paid portion as well, don't you? Yes, we have a grad program. That is uh, your, your friend. Grad program. Nice. That's where they, they get the good stuff. Watch this, dude. They get the good stuff. Yeah. So I, we call the, the the grad program. They get they get two extra uh, things a, a a week, and also when we do training classes and and things like that, we always send out the invitations. Hmm. We open the training classes up to grad program people first, Very because cool. they have an investment in the product. Yeah, you know, That's we awesome. like to have people who are invested. Do you uh, so you you do tr uh, teach courses around the country? Oh yeah, uh, we've got this summer. We've got two long range precision rifle classes. I'm in Wyoming and uh, our range is at 7,300 feet above sea level and you can do things with bullets. You can do things with bullets at 7,300 feet that you can't do anywhere else. Really? Yeah. We do magical stuff. Like what? Like, well, the thing is, uh, there's less air out there. Yeah. And so you just, you can get, you can stretch it out. Really? Yeah. The, uh, the, the range we have has a 1.5 mile target on it. Now there's <laughs> that many cartridges in the world that, that can consistently hit a 1.5 mile target. Right. But we got thousand yard targets, we got a mile long target. And uh, yeah, we get people out there who never shot beyond hundred yards, we get them on a thousand. As long as they got the, the gear and they can Head pay attention. South, South Capitol Avenue toward West Maryland. So yeah, no, I, I love teaching that. That's that's kind of my passion. And I, I'll teach anything, you know, handguns, rifles, shotguns and stuff. Yeah. But my, my, my passion really is, and I guess it's because I was a Marine and every Marine is a rifleman. Is, uh, is really being able to, to stretch it out and shoot long range. That's cool. And Wyoming is rifle country. Yeah, no kidding. I think some of the stupid uh, things in New England. I thought this was, uh, I thought this was New England specific, but um, you can't hunt, you can't hunt deer with rifles in Massachusetts. Oh yeah, that's uh, Pennsylvania's that same way. Ohio's that same way. I thought uh, I, I grew up in Illinois, so I, I think thought Pennsylvania is. I don't know. I know Ohio definitely is. Yeah, well, Illinois is too. You can't mm -hmm. hunt, and I'm like, why can't you hunt deer with a rifle? I'm like, is it just the land's flat? It just keeps going. Yeah, they, they say like, oh, the bullet travels too far or, or whatever, and I'm like, okay, whatever, it's cool story, bro. Right. Um, it's like if you negligently fire a foster slug from a 12 gauge it's gonna go a long it's way gonna, yeah it's yeah yeah it's so. ridiculous all right well listen i uh we, we're gonna wrap things up yeah people can find everything student of the gun you got the uh, the grad school um we want to thank you guys for watching this episode of writing shotgun with charlie if you are not a member of the second amendment foundation you can join them at saf.org 150 bucks for a lifetime membership uh, you can find all of your favorite pro freedom podcasts at the uh, Self Defense Radio Network, SDRN.US is where you can find that. And if you made it this far, you definitely need to be sharing this show with other people because this is how we get the stagecoach across America. Um, that's what I got. We're going to get a stoplight here. We'll shake hands. Call it a day. There you go. Very, Very cool. cool. Paul, thank you so much yeah. for being on the show. Thank this was great. Much. This was awesome. I appreciate it. Thank Appreciate you. the opportunity.